Um, that last panel was so inspiring. My daughters, eight and five, are at home watching this online, and I'm just so proud they were able to see that. And I want you to know, uh, Sir Lucian, that I did not choose that walkout music, just to be clear. <laughs> um, we're, we're very honored to be joined by Sir Lucian Grange, honored by the Queen of England with the Order of the British Empire and Knight Bachelor, CEO of the world's largest music company, number one on this year's Billboard Power List, but perhaps most impressively and most importantly, started his career as a music publisher. Sir Lucian, tell us about how you got your start in publishing and how that led you to where you are now. Uh, thank you, David, and, and it's good to see you all. Uh, I was working at a, um, as a, uh, an artist management company as a runner, and I was uh, so important there in my first job, making, I think, 20 pounds a week, that it was my job to get the assistants their sandwiches. <laughs> um, I realized very quickly that I wasn't very good at it um, and that I thought I was, I'd got a job as a runner in a music company, a management company, to be involved in music. So I intentionally always used to screw up the orders. So if someone wanted jello, I'd put peanut butter on and, and eventually they stopped asking me. Um, I heard through that I'd, I'd been introduced to people, engineers, uh, and what were in those days called professional managers at Chapel Music and, um, and also Intersong. And they had incredible studios. Publishing companies in those days had amazing studios 40, 45 years ago. And I fell into that. And I spent a lot of time with... Uh, writers um, and the professional managers in those publishing companies, in the studios with the engineers. And then I ran into um, some Australian songwriters, uh, one of them who's called was Steve Kipner. And uh, I became friends with him, and they had just written. Uh, he'd been involved with a, another gentleman, and his father had done the arrangements on a song that Johnny Mathis had had a big hit with. So. Um, they'd recorded these songs and in the studio with brilliant engineers and I thought they were amazing. So now I was, all of a sudden I was a manager, but I was managing songwriters. Um, then you move back, a, probably about four years then, because I'm around 18 in this time. Uh, I've been on my bicycle and I've been knocked over and uh, I got some compensation. So I got about the equivalent of 4,000 pounds and that went into a kitty, which my parents wouldn't let me spend. And when I was 18, then I could start to draw it down. And that was really what funded my introduction to music publishing and managing writers. I went to meet them. Uh, I would sit at the bar at the Martinez, 1978, 79. Uh, I get a drink, a glass of wine, and it was so expensive. So I cottoned on that I just buy uh, pressed lemon juice, which was cheap, and then I'd fill it with tap water, and I'd get there at six o'clock before anyone would get there, get my place at the bar, drink cheap tap water, free tap water and lemon juice because it was so bitter, and just sit there and meet people. I slept on floors. Um, and then, fast forward again, I suppose, what seemed like an eternity is when you're starting in your career and something that you love. I was offered, um, I, I, I applied for and ended up getting a job at what was a company called April Blackwood. Um, I, was nine, uh, I was 18, I was 19 when I really sort of got started. Um, and I was called a professional manager. My job was to uh, look at the songwriters there and the roster of uh, writers, grubby talent scout. Um, and they used to try and get me not to go to gigs because it, was, it cost them money and, and uh, it wasn't worth it. But, I found, we found a band um, that was the first major band. And I remember my boss at the time to do this. You, you know, you don't have to put your career on the line and so on and so on. And I said, no, I really want to do this. Um, and it was the Psychedelic Furs. And that was the first actual band that I signed. Um, and it started on, on a trajectory of, of obviously signing writers. 
and I've spent uh, my entire career, 12 years, running publishing companies. It's an amazing path. Um, now, as head of Universal, you've recently purchased some of the most iconic song catalogs of all, and, and Mark Cimino, such as Bob Dylan, Sting, Neil Diamond. What do you look for when you're investing in song catalogs? Um, class and quality and uh, I iconic works and iconic writers. Um, works that, um, that are defined and have moved culture. Music that when you listen to, you know where you were, what you were doing, how old you were uh, when you first heard it, etc. We've been very selective. Um, we've been, I think, probably more selective than a lot of people think that we have. We don't buy stuff, we don't buy uh, income streams, uh, we leave that to others, obviously. Um, and it's something which I've been doing, frankly, for decades. Uh, I was uh, originally part of the team uh, that bought uh, Dick James Music. Uh, it's probably 35, 30, probably 35 years ago or so. Um, in those days, as incredible as it sounds, the Obviously, the value that we were so committed to was in the music publishing rights. And absolutely no one actually wanted to take on the record rights. <laughs> um, and the same happened a couple of years later. We found out that uh, ABBA was available through uh, Stig and Polar Music. And so then we bought BMG Music Publishing and obviously EMI Records. So this sort of journey of uh, my career and working with the teams to to acquire, to invest in things that we were passionate about, things that we believed, things that were important, and things that we could contribute to as a music company. You know, we're not a financial player. Uh, we're not a fund. Um, and we're proud of what we do, and we're proud of the thousands of people that we have around the world. Uh, and that's what they do. Um, and um, that's, that's our commitment. Yeah. There's been a lot of speculation recently about the multiples that are paid for these catalogs and whether the prices are, are too high. I'm on record as saying that I think we're going to look back at this period and, and find that, that buyers have actually gotten a bargain. And um, a couple of days ago, Goldman Sachs came out with a report uh, that seems to agree with that perspective. Um, because I don't think that, that the multiple question is fully taken into account the, the new revenue streams that are being developed, which you've been very active in helping to develop. So how do you view the multiple question when coming up with what it's worth to buy when you know that you're buying it for the future um, that, that seems to look so bright? Um, well, Paula, that's a secret sauce in a way. Um, <laughs> that's why I ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that there is a finite pool to what our ambition should be as an industry. I, I think that all of us who are in music uh, and who believe in the value of copyright and the value of IP and understand how to discover it and or to invest in it um, should work together to actually grow that pool. Um, so uh, in terms of the multiples, uh, all I know that whenever my experience, whenever I've bought and I've, I've wanted to press the button on something which I care deeply about, whether or not it was in music publishing that goes back 30, 35 years, or whether or not it was in recorded music, uh, which obviously includes our investment in, in EMI, whatever it was, 10 or 11 years ago, um, it's always worked out. I believe in the resilience of music. I believe in the power of music. I believe in the importance of it. And uh, as I said, there is no finite pull to everything that all of us here should be trying to achieve with it. Yeah. So one priority I know that's been important to you is elevating music from, from different parts of the world. Where do you see is the most untapped or underrepresented in terms of the global music scene? I think... Um, this is the advantage of the technology um, and the develops in, developments in music that we've, we've, we've leaned into. Um, there is present day thinking. Some people are in the past. There's present day thinking and then there's people 
who live in the future and thinking about the future. And when you look at consumers, audience, demographics uh, in India, Asia, Africa, for example, rhythms, beats, cultures, the amount of disparate around the world, um, I think it's incredibly compelling. And I think it's uh, uh, incumbent on us. I think it's a, a great um, contribution that the technology and the platforms have made, and they've got to be credited with it, that we have been able to actually cross borders and anything is possible now. But, you know, do I think that, that the significance of uh, three, four hundred million uh, people under the age of 25 or around 25 over the next decade in the sub-Saharan continent are going to be listening to and enjoying uh, and creating well, either as creators and artists and writers uh, or even as consumers, the answer is yes. So I think it's, it's, we feel that it's all there to play for, I'm very committed to it. And um, I think it's brilliant that uh, something that was created in um, Chile can now be heard in London. Yeah. So other than uh, Madeline Bailey, who we just heard, are there any young artists who are not household names today, but that you think that are going to be future stars and that the audience should know yeah, about? Yeah, in 1993, I did an interview in, in London and I was asked that exact same question and I thought I was a genius. I, I laid out about four or five acts that this is when I was running Polygram Music Publishing uh, that I thought were going to break and they're all on different labels and so on and so on. And of course I got slaughtered and killed by at least the other 30 artists that I didn't mention. So um, I'm only half stupid. Uh, so I'm not going to answer the question, but what I can say is that I've... <laughs> Well, I can, I can say is I've, I've always been committed to genres. And when you've been around as long as I have, I've been through genres. Um, I, I, you know, I talked about the late 70s. I, I, I was around punk. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the, um, the Pistols um, drama documentary. Um, I, I was there. Uh, we lived two miles from Wardour Street and the Andra Club and the Marquee and, and I didn't have green hair or razors attached to anywhere, I can assure you, but I loved it. And that, I learned from that the, the power of culture, of movements, of, of joy, of people loving scenes. And I applied that to whether or not it was, I don't know, 10 or 12 years late, 15 years later, what we now call um, indie bands, and we had Shed Seven and Cast, and that had come out of the Lars in Liverpool. And of course that then turned into o Oasis and Blur. Um, some of the hip hop records uh, that, you know, my commitment to hip hop a decade or so ago, 11, 12 years ago, when I came to the US, uh, it was so many, it's, it was you know, that sort of rejuvenation and the investment in it and the belief in it and the ability to partner with people and trust them. Um, it's something that's guided me. And um, there's always, there's all, scenes come and go. Genres are, can be incredibly exciting. And I see that you're giving the Eurythmics an award uh, tomorrow. Um, I ran RCA Music in 1982, 83. We signed them then. Um, they may not remember, but it was important to me that they recorded that album on 8-track above a Ford dealership in Chalk Farm. Um, that wasn't a... That, that, that wasn't a... That was a time and special music. So, uh, genres, cycles, uh, I've, always, I've always believed in and I always will. Yeah. Your company is one of several that have engaged in some initiatives recently to address some of the past practices in an effort to be more creator friendly. Things like participation in stock liquidations, review of unrecouped balances, health initiatives. How have you approached these issues and what do you want artists and songwriters to know about Universal's approach to this kind of holistic new view of the industry? Um, there's an enormous amount in a, in a large company that uh, has 
uh, operates in 160 countries um, and has about 75, 80 wholly owned businesses in each country. There are record companies, music publishing companies, merchandise businesses, they're all separate. And uh, what we do, um, what we've done uh, around social justice, around what we've done uh, in South Africa, uh, what we've done in mental health in the UK, um, the, the work that the teams uh, have done in, in the US with regard to uh, medical care and education and food banks is something that we, we don't shout about that. You know, I think it's a sort of a, a, a duty. Um, and I like to think that we make a contribution to it um, and that we, we, we do our bit. But, you know, I and we are not the kind of people that sort of stand up on the balcony and shout and, and, and fly planes over like they do on the beach sometimes, <laughs> announcing what you've done. That's not who we are. You may not, but, but I think it's worth mentioning it and getting recognition for it because I think it's important. Um, Later tonight, obviously, we're honoring Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is perhaps most famous for Hamilton and telling the story of the American Revolution as someone of British heritage. <laughs> is, is there anything that you would like to try to correct in his historical record? Uh, how could I ever correct someone who's written such brilliant hits? And... Um, I do like a great song, and I do like a successful project. So I have n nothing to comment on other than <laughs> respect. Well done. Well done. Not taking the bait on anything tonight. Um, Not 1993 again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get you out of here on this. Um, tomorrow night, Jody Gerson is going to be honored with the Abe Ullman Publisher Award at the, at the Songwriters Hall of Fame induction ceremony, and you're going to have the privilege of introducing her. Um, tell me about who Jody is to you and how you knew she was going to be such a great leader of Universal Music Publishing. Um, I tried to bring Jody in for several years and she's probably back there listening on the speaker, cringing. Um, and she turned me down. Um, but I didn't give up. She is a... Look, we know about artists, empathy, EQ, the ability to sign artists, to spot talent, um, to back people, to have the confidence when you're not sure um, and you have the confidence to actually give someone the air cover to succeed. Uh, she does all that. Um, she's an incredible fighter. And one of the things that uh, she's not cloaked in the, the uh, she doesn't sort of hide behind songwriter advocacy. Uh, she's someone that walks the talk. Um, and at least every six or eight weeks, I get a call from a CEO uh, of a large company, I'm not going to say what kind of company, but it might be a platform, it might be a games business, who knows, and, and says, look, look uh, Jody, is, she's great, you know, I really like her, but she's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> she's killing me. And I admire her for that, I admire her independence, I hope that we give her the independence, I hope that we give her, as a group, as I said, the air cover, uh, to, to fight, um, to develop, uh, and the space to do all the incredible things that I hope that we do as a company. I, I believe passionately in exceptionalism. I try and instill that into all the teams, uh, into our publishing division, into anything that we do. I believe in, I think in exceptionalism and striving for that is critically important. Well, I know you don't do a lot of things like this, but we really appreciate you coming back to your roots in music publishing and joining us today. So ladies and gentlemen, Sir Lucian. Thank you very much. Thank you.